Okay, so we're going to shift a little bit on the metabolic talk, okay? And so hopefully by now, most of you have some level of understanding of the actual pathways, okay? So what we're going to talk really today about is how do we fit the pathways together, okay? And then how is the togetherness of those pathways going to shift based upon intensity or duration of exercise? or maybe on what you eat before you're gonna go exercise or something. In our lab, we've been having a discussion that I was asked about from my undergrads, which is on a TikTok of a Raider Rice Krispie treat before I exercise, am I gonna get a better pump at the end of all of this? Which somehow devolved into a whole bunch of things. But, right, what you eat beforehand may have some influence on the metabolic pathways that are being used. The intensity of exercise may have some influence. Okay, the duration, it may change all of this. So the first part of this that we're going to talk about is the rate control of the metabolic pathways. Okay. And in the context of talking about rate control, we're going to figure out what I'm going to call the temporal organization. So the time organization of all of these pathways as they work together. Okay as they work together. The thing to remember, all pathways are active all the time, okay? All the time. You may not be able to measure after a certain point any further decline in sort of free ATP or free creatine phosphate. But my assumption is that we're making a little bit of that back and we're still breaking a little bit down. But generally, this is going to refer to glycolysis, and the aerobic pathways are both working all the time, okay? You're sitting here at rest, you're making some lactic acid, all right? When you're jogging, you're making some lactic acid. Your metabolic pathway, your aerobic pathways are sort of, when you sprint, you may be mostly using creatine phosphate or glycolysis, but you're still getting some ATP from your mitochondria. So they're all working all the time. Okay, keep that in mind, all right? Keep that in mind. What we're gonna talk about today is which pathway predominates the vast or which one's gonna give you the majority of your energy for that exercise path. And that is gonna depend upon the demand of the, of the exercise. What's its intensity? What's its duration, okay? How much force does it require to do that? and the speed of the various metabolic pathways, okay? The speed of the pathways is important because I need energy right now. You can imagine from an evolutionary standpoint why that is important, right? If it's, I don't know, 30,000 years ago and Gabe is out trying to hunt and gather and he encounters a giant super bear or something, he needs to either fight off said bear or run away from said bear, or he is going to, you know, get eaten potentially. I don't know if bears eat people or if they just kill us because, you know, they're giant. They're like, ooh, fun. Oops, right? This is what happened. Polar bears, beautiful, super cute, terribly deadly, all right? But the speed of the pathways matters, right? And so the body doesn't care where it gets the energy from most of the time. It just knows I got to run. So get me ATP from somewhere. Okay. And so the speed of each pathway, it's like, look, this can contribute this much right now. This can contribute this much right now. Just give me that energy and we'll sort the rest of it out as we're running away. Okay. Much of this comes down to supply versus demand. All right, supply versus demand. Each pathway has its own rate control steps, right? The slowest step in each reaction is its rate control point. There's going to be an enzyme generally that is the rate limiting or rate controlling step in that pathway. And each pathway can only go as fast as its slowest step, right? 
And so we've got to understand those things. The other piece to keep in mind is that while the rate control step is constant across time and intensities, the metabolic rate of that, or the rate of that pathway is going to change because we have an ability to alter sort of the rate of those rate control impacts. We'll talk about kind of where those are and how that happens. Okay. The other piece of this to keep in mind is the downside of this. Some pathways who shall remain nameless, we're looking at butyrethrin phosphate and glycolysis. Okay. Some pathways either use up the stuff and they can't go anymore, or they make things at the end that are going to feed back into the, the rest of that pathway or other pathways and inhibit them and slow them down and thus limit, right? Limit or inhibit the other pathways and limit our ability to produce ATP. Which at the end of the day means we have to slow down or stop. It causes fatigue. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. Okay. Y'all good with me so far? Yeah, we need to get up and do some jumping jacks. I'm seeing some, I know it's Wednesday, you know, we're working on things, right? Like, you know, we're okay. We need to get perked up a little. We give y'all some caffeine and Stimulate some fat metabolism and increase our metabolic rate and those kinds of things. Okay. All right. Why is this not working? Okay. Let's start with this. If we group these or we rank these in order of speed, which we've already done, the creatine phosphate or our phosphogen pathways in general are faster. Then glycolysis. Glycolysis is faster than the oxidative sort of phosphorylation pathway. So I apologize, I've used these terms sort of interchangeably. This is oxphos is used is what happens at the end of the, uh, at the end of the electron transport chain. There's also a thing called substrate phosphorylation. Substrate phosphorylation. That's what happens with glycolysis, right? Or with the creatine phosphate pathway. So don't worry about it. This is just the aerobic pathway. So Krebs. And the DPC here. Okay. Well, let's talk about rate control of the creatine phosphate pathway first. Okay. Primarily, the thing that controls the rate of creatine phosphate pathway is ADP. Okay. As ADP levels go up, it drives the reaction. As they go down, it shuts off or inhibits the reaction. Okay. It's very simple. It's this one to one reaction where if you've got creatine phosphate and you've got ADP, it drives it in this direction. If the ATP levels are high, then we don't need to break all of this down. Okay. Typically, this pathway is going to be used until the creatine phosphate levels are maybe not entirely gone, but are going to reach some kind of critically low level. And it's not going to come back until we stop exercising. Okay. Until we can replenish it during epoch in those things. Okay. So you're here, right? We do fun things like we say, Richard, get up and do some push ups for us. And he starts doing push ups. He needs energy immediately. ADP levels start to rise. You immediately then begin to break down creatine phosphate because you have a bunch of these enzymes. Okay. I can inject you, I guess, with ADP. Then you get that, that same kind of reaction. Right? Okay. Now let's talk about something that's more complicated. Let's talk about glycolysis. So the phosphogen ones are easy, they're simple, they're straightforward. Glycolysis is, is tricky. There are roughly sort of four enzymes that control a lot of the things that are going on during glycolysis. Okay? I'm going to list them in order of where they occur in the steps of glycolysis, but I want you to remember that step three here that is, that is run by phosphofructokinase, or PFK, this is the true rate limiting step, okay, here. But activity of the phosphorylase enzyme is going to matter and play some role in things. And then the back two, lactate dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase, are also going to play a role, okay? And so 
even though PFK is the slowest, the other ones are also going to potentially be some hit points at very times. Let's start with phosphorylase. Okay. I think we mentioned this before, but we'll kind of go back over it again just to make sure. You store carbohydrate in your body as glycogen. Okay. You have glycogen that is going to be in your liver, and you have glycogen that is going to be in the muscle, okay? When we're doing muscle contractions, primarily we want to mobilize muscle glycogen in order to use that glucose that is freed up from there for to go through glycolysis or going to the prep side. So, the muscle side of those things is the thing that we're going to use initially in exercise. Okay. Anybody know what liver glycogen tends to be used for? Blood glucose. What about blood glucose? You know? And the brain, but I have liver glycogen in my is the, what is how is it related to my blood glucose though? Like you're right, but can we? Anybody not have lunch? Anybody not eating in a while? No? You should have had the pistachios, Richard. And we've been giving Richard a hard time about this. I love pistachios. And Richard has this bag of pistachios sitting on his desk, and it's been there for a month. If I had that bag, I would have eaten them all in two days. Richard is a man of much more self-control than me. Okay. So if you've not eaten recently, and your blood glucose levels begin to fall, what will tend to happen is you will break down liver glycogen in an effort to take glycogen and those glucose stores in the liver and maintain your blood glucose levels because your brain needs glucose. If during exercise, which we'll talk about a little bit later, we begin to take glucose into muscle cells out of the blood, then that will also stimulate the liver to break down its glycogen to replenish that glucose that's in the blood as well. Okay. Uh, um, we store, like, what is it? What happens when you have like very high blood glucose? It all depends. So there is a response after exercise or after fasting, and if you've broken a bunch of it down, then that tends to stimulate glycogen synthase. And when you eat a bunch of carbs, you will use some of those carbs to try to replenish it. If for whatever reason you have high levels of muscle glycogen and high levels of liver glycogen already, and you eat a bunch, then that insulin signal that you get from all of that is going to try to store it in adipose tissue and turn it into fat. And that's why we're all type 2 diabetics. It's way more complicated. That's the chip lunch that you just okay. That's why people will be like, oh, but if you still never eat carbs and you can eat however much food you want and you'll never gain weight. And I'm like, mm, it's not exactly probably true, but that's kind of what we're going on. Okay. So the point of all of this is that phosphorylase is an enzyme that functions to split glycogen into glucose. Okay. So it's called glycogen phosphorylase in some textbooks, but You've got a phosphorylase that breaks down muscle glycogen and a phosphorylase that will break down liver glycogen. Both of those are what we call allosteric enzymes. Okay, anybody remember your biochemistry? Remember what an allosteric enzyme is? It regulates the function. So to be allosteric means that certain things can bind to that enzyme and turn it on or off, or kind of make its rate go faster or make its rate go slower, right? And so calcium, AMP, and ADP, as well as the catecholamine, so that being norex, all activate the phosphorylase and are gonna stimulate phosphorylase to break down glycogen, okay? So you get a fight or flight response, we freak or skill it out about a quiz, Epi and norepi get released, 
immediately is going to begin to activate phosphorylase and she's going to start breaking down some glycogen fight or flight response okay she's a little bit like stress but that's also the same kind of thing of like i gotta fight somebody I gotta fight like a blocker i gotta run away okay so that's what's going to happen there and so you will note calcium or muscle contractions amp adp and epi and nor epi you know we don't talk about endo very much in here all of these things are going to increase in response to muscle contraction. All of these things are going to increase during exercise, and they tend to increase in proportion to exercise intensity. And so exercise by itself is going to function to turn on the phosphorylase enzyme to a greater extent and begin to break down glycogen to supply glucose, start going through glycolysis. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So when we've got more glucose, we can stick more things into glycolysis. We're just jamming more stuff in on the front end in the hopes that that might be beneficial. Okay. PFK is the third step. This is the slowest. One. PFK is also an allosteric enzyme. Okay. It is going to be largely inhibited at rest because. ATP, creatine phosphate, hydrogen ions, and high levels of citrate, which is right, going to be used in Krebs, these things tend to largely inhibit PFK. So these are things that are going to indicate we've probably got a fair amount of energy right now. We don't need to speed up glycolysis. Okay? It is activated by many of the same kind of things. AMP, ADP, inorganic phosphate, Okay, you can look at what's going on in the midst of all of this. So PFK is interesting. It has kind of a U-shaped activation. Point. At rest, it's largely inhibited. It goes pretty slow. During very heavy exercise, when you make a lot of lactic acid and hydrogen ions go up, when you become more acidic, it's also going to be inhibited. And then during kind of moderate, kind of light, moderate to some sort of kind of heavy amounts of action. We would call this severe. You know, this is kind of you're jogging pretty vigorously here. Then AMP and ADP and the organic phosphate are high. That's going to that's going to drive the okay. What happens is this is the slowest step. But I start activating phosphorylase. I get more glucose. I start sticking more glucose into glycolysis. Then I speed up PFK. So now I can move more of that glucose through the pathways, right? And so once I start doing that, I'm going to make some ATP as we're moving our way down. And then depending upon what happens distal to this, I'm either going to start making more lactic acid, yes, or I'm going to start sticking more things into the Krebs cycle, also yes. And we're going to kind of balance things out. Are you all with me so far? Okay. You would ask that. And I don't, I don't remember the typically you get ammonia from like the breakdown of amino acids. So where, where does it come? Where is this coming from? Ah, that's where you get the ammonia. Oh, see, there we go. It's been 20 years since I've had biochemistry. So there we go. So if this gets further broken down, either way, it's bad. Okay. It's bad from a metabolic standpoint. So it's like, hey, speed this up so we can make some more, make some more ATP. Okay. Now, the end part of all of this is where, where things are going to get a little bit tricky. Okay. Or maybe not tricky as long as we keep everything in, in the proper context. So we've got our glucose, right? We're going to move the glucose down to pyruvate. Okay, so in this, we've got, we've got our phosphorylase, it's going to get us some glucose. Here we've got PFK, that's going to help drive that glucose into pyruvate. Now we've got the pyruvate, and that pyruvate is going to go in one of two directions that we kind of already talked about. We can make lactic acid. Or we can move into our transition step and then eventually go to the Krebs cycle. Okay. So at this point, 
pyruvate can interact with either the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme or the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. Whichever one of these it happens to bump into is going to determine does it go to lactic acid or does it transition into the into the Krebs cycle? Okay. So Dave asked about this and the thing that he found late at night the other night. And on these things, we're going to talk about this. Now, you have different activities of LDH enzymes based upon your muscle fiber type. Okay. So those of you that are predominantly fast switchers have a more active LDH enzyme. So again, more biochemistry. This is a has sort of they come in what are called different isozymes, but they have multiple subunits. Weirdly enough, LDH occurs in what's called a heart and a muscle subunit. Okay. The heart subunit is slow. The muscle subunit is faster in some way, shape, or form. So in type 2X muscle fibers, you have two isozymes of the muscle. So it runs fast. The enzyme is more active. Okay? It requires a lower concentration of pyruvate to generate any amount of lactic acid. In slow twitch fibers, you have a double isozyme typically of the heart isozyme, which is a slower one and is less active so you have to have more pyruvate get built up before we're going to drive any concentration of lactic acid. Okay. So there is a level of fiber type stuff, and then in two A's and in some things, there are going to be some mixing of the, the heart and the muscle and, and all of that together. Okay. So that's what's going on there. Right. That's the LDH. PDH basically then drives ourselves into the Krebs cycle. PDH, there's not a lot. So LDH is not particularly allosteric. It's not really turned on or off or activated or inhibited by any kind of stuff that is around. Okay? PDH tends to be activated by calcium and by ADP. Okay? So the things that turn on phosphorylase and PFK generally turn on PDH. And it's largely inhibited by, weirdly enough, high levels of free fatty acids in the blood, which we'll maybe get to at the very end today. So if you're using a lot of fat for energy, then that fat is getting dumped into the Krebs cycle. So it shuts off PDH. So there's no need to metabolize carbohydrate. Okay? which will play some role in what you guys see that happens with long duration exercise. You begin to shift from using carbohydrates early to using more fat later on. And part of that is driven by, as you begin to mobilize fat out of adipose tissue, those free fatty acids will inhibit PDH. So it kind of shuts down some of this use of glucose and helps us use more fat, okay? And low glycogen levels. So this, Right, muscle glycogen gets really, really low. It's going to want to shut some of this down um, in that particular way as well. But that's going to control this. So basically, to this point, okay, all we're talking about is carbohydrate metabolism. And all we're talking about is I need X amount of ATP. So while you guys are sitting here right now, phosphorylase is largely inhibited, PFK is largely inhibited. You need a certain amount of energy to just sit there and almost doze off to sleep because I'm super boring today. Then you are making some amount of pyruvate. Some of that is interacting with LDH. And you're making a little bit of lactic acid. Most of it is going this direction simply because then that both of these two things in combination lets you meet your overall ATP demands. Okay? Lets you meet your overall ATP. As you start to exercise, as you stand up, as you walk, as you begin to jog, initially creatine phosphate, phosphogen stores. We're going to start here by jamming more, activating phosphorylase, activating PFK. We're going to begin to activate PDH. 
This goes, we start shoving and making more pyruvate. As I get more pyruvate, yeah, more is going to go this way, but more is also going to go over here. And this is a one step process, but I make the lactic acid, and then that lets me recycle, right? I can recycle my NAD molecule, so I can keep doing this. While this speeds up, but then it's got to go to Krebs, and it's got to go all the way around Krebs, and then it's got to go to the electron transport chain, and that shit is slow. Okay? And so until that gets sped up, I'm going to start doing this more in order to meet my energy demand. I'm still getting some from here, but this is going to go. As the stuff downstream from here, as we will see, as that downstream stuff begins to speed up, then it starts making large amounts of ATP, which will hopefully let me meet my demand, okay? Lower my ADP levels, begin to shut these things down, and I'm making some amount down here that lets me kind of keep this in a nice balance where pyruvate can go here, I can make a little bit of lactic acid, but I'm good for kind of all of my ADP production. Then as intensity keeps going up and up, right? You transition, I'm walking, I'm jogging, I'm fine, but at some point I need so much that it's basically all I can do to run both of these as fast as possible and I just start making as much as I can. And at some point, even then, that's not going to be enough ATP, and they're going to have to, they have to recharge. Okay? So I'll see a little bit about how these things fit together and how that interaction is going to work. That the end game is I need 20 molecules of ATP or 30 molecules of ATP to do this. We've just got to figure out what the mix from all of this is to let me get that amount of ATP. If I, once I get to that mix, then these things can begin to kind of equilibrate and will alter the function of these enzymes. And then it kind of gets me into ideally a place where aerobic metabolism can supply most of it. So the pyruvate can all be handled here. It doesn't have to go this way. I don't make lactic acid. I don't have hydrogen ions that cause fatigue. Allegedly cause fatigue. There are some people who argue that they don't. I don't like that. I'm just going to say that. Okay. So we can make an argument that the rate of aerobic metabolism is influenced by the rate of glycolysis, which is controlled by all of these enzymes. In other words, it's really controlled by the change in the concentration of glucose and the change in the concentration. So, you guys remember anything about? I should ask this. How many people have actually had biochemistry? Anybody actually had biochemistry? Desire is the only one. Okay. So, if you have Desire, if I say Michaelis Minton plot to you, does it ring any bells? Remember anything? You hated the Michaelis Minton plot. Okay. We can graph, it's about enzyme kinetics, it's about how we control. The concentration of the substrate and the speed of the enzyme, how when you alter the con you don't have to alter, you can alter either the concentration of the substrate or the speed of the enzyme, and you're going to get, you can predict how much of an end product you're going to get. And you can do these things through what are called Michaelis Minton plots, and I'll show you guys one when we talk about adaptations to aerobic training. But all of this is controlled by Michaelis Minton kinetics, and so you can. Change the concentrations of glucose that you feed into the system, and that will change which pathway is going as long as these enzymes are all running at some phase. You can hold the glucose amount constant and alter the speed of the, of the enzymes, and that will change where things are going. Both of those things happen at different points during exercise, and they're going to have very predictable changes on. Are we using glucose or are we using lipids? Are we making lactic acid or are we not making lactic acid? Okay. And so all of this, these are all just random interactions that are going to take place. Just imagine Brady is a molecule of pyruvate. This room is the inside of a cell and he's wandering around in here with his eyes closed. And everything that happens is from whatever he manages to bump into. Okay. He bumps into skillet 
and she's an LDH enzyme, she's going to turn him into lactic acid. Okay. And she's in a fast twitch muscle, so she does it really quickly. Right. So there's only one of her in here. So it only happens when he bumps into her. Five of y'all are PDH molecules. When he gets bumped into one of you guys, then you go into the Krebs cycle. But it's slow, so he might bump into skillet before he bumps into you guys. Okay. And so it's all these random interactions that are happening. If Brady's a glucose molecule and we give like three of him into the system, then it's much more likely that one of them will bump into any of the rest of you guys. And that, so we change the concentration and that drives things. If I change how many skillets there are in the class rate, there's more LDH enzymes, so the thing becomes more likely. Okay? And so you can change enzyme concentration or enzyme kinetics, which can change substrate concentrations, and it alters what's going to happen in these things. Okay? And so generally in glycolysis, we change the enzyme speed, and then the enzyme like phosphorylase changes the concentration of glucose. And that's kind of what the way we're going to control. Okay. Yeah, you have a question? I see there may be a question on chat here. Uh, Jordan, you've had biochemistry. You should have asked Jordan. Jordan, draw some Achilles mitten blood. So, um, everybody's like, yay, bio. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I can look it up. Part of it's going to be from low power reading levels, but get low glycogen levels, then you're still going to have relatively high blood glucose. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. Okay. All right. So I told you guys, right, that PDH is allosteric and it can change its function. Calcium and ADP increase its activity. Here's a measure. Right, and this is all in like sort of a, in isolated muscles. I can't measure your individual PDH function. It'd be cool if I could. Right. Here's PDH activation. Right, just use these as sort of relative terms. And here we've got 10 minutes of exercise at 35% of maximal force, 65%, 90% of human space. And what you're looking at is look at, okay, look at the rates that are going to happen. I've got, I get 35%. It takes it about you know, a minute to get up here and do this. I get to 65. All of these, it's taking roughly a minute or thereabouts. Okay. Then there may be a little bit of slow creep with these higher ones as they're going to go up. But look, it's taking like a minute for sure to get PDH activated so that as the pyruvate concentration is going to begin to change during exercise, PDH activity speeds up so it can now. Grab more pyruvate and send them over to the prep side. You all remember oxygen deficit? Yes. At the onset of exercise, we have some amount of energy that we need that cannot be supplied by aerobic pathways. One of the reasons why it can't and why it's supplied via anaerobic through glycolysis is that look, this gets kicked up, I make more pyruvate, but the pH hasn't sped up enough to be able to handle that extra pyruvate. So it just goes over here, we do this for a little while. Until this catches up, and then we're fine. Okay, well, it's fine if you're at ninety percent, probably screwed. But it's a separate, a separate kind of thing. Okay, so the ability of these enzymes to get allosterically activated and the time it takes to do that is going to play a role in energy deficit. So if you're, let's just say, a distance runner, if you want to go and warm up, right? You want to go ahead and get this activated before you have to run your race. Because if you're a miler, let's just say, you know, what do people run the mile in? Like what's world record mile pace is what somewhere like 350 or yeah, 345, 347. I don't know. It's fucking fast. Okay. But if it's going to take a minute to get things up there, that's a quarter of your race time. Right? That's not cool. We don't want that. So 
do some warm up, try to get this thing turned on a little bit so that when you start, you're not on, you may not be at the very top of this yet, but you're much closer to what that activity is going to be than if you were just going cold. Okay. I had a question. You had said that you were sitting in class. Yeah, you don't need to warm up to go sprint. Oh, I didn't care about those. Those are dumb. You don't need to warm up for those. Right, because I mean, those things involve sort of intermittent high intensity kinds of things where it's like sprint for three seconds and stop, right? Soccer is a little bit different. Soccer is a weird thing, right? And so the idea of I've done some warm up, I've got my aerobic metabolism up. All that's useful for that is that maybe by doing the warm up, you're going to recover between that first and second sprinting bout a little bit faster or something in those kinds of things. You're just going to go sprint. It's mostly anaerobic. You're just blowing through your creatine phosphate anyway. And so you're probably not going long enough to have an increased rate of PDA. It's going to really, really matter. Football is special. So like the long plays in football last like 10 seconds, maybe, or something. So in that way, and then once you've done a couple of those, it's already on, it's turned on, it's like, okay, then we're, we're rocking and rolling from there. But same thing, like if you're going to do a sprint, like whatever, you can go run 100 meters, like then 10 seconds, who cares what your arrow is about the race? Although people do warm up now, so it's you know, kind of already. Did you not say that warming up for the sprint is good at injury prevention? Zero evidence to suggest that. Zero. Did I tell you guys, so I've never pulled a muscle in my entire life until the summer. Pulled my muscle at Orange Theory right on the treadmill. Um, I take a little bit of time off and I learned and I did that. And I have no, like it's still like this was in like July. I'm still not okay. Which reminds me that I need to call them and be like, can you put me on hold for another month? But it's a catastrophic failure in something that no amount of, in most instances, no amount of warming up. Stretching does nothing for all of that, right? Like if, it, if stretching mattered, like I would just like go to the end of my range of motion and my leg would just snap in half or something. So there's very, very little compelling evidence that those kinds of things prevent those kinds of conditions. Now, if you're going to tell me that you're a person like me who's not very flexible, and I'm going to need to go do something that's going to involve high forces to a very large range motion that I can't normally move myself through very easily, then things are a little bit different. Stretching improves range of motion, and for a lot of sports, having a large range of motion is actually a beneficial thing. And so, but like stretching before you go run, it's not going to keep you from being hurt when you're going to run. Stretching, you know, every day for a month may then make your range of motion, but it will allow you when you've got a really sprint and reach in those things. To kind of do those things. So it's good in some ways, but it's not great to kind of acutely prevent the injury. Don't buy into the athletic trainers. Yeah. Great for rehab. I have an injury. I need to stretch my hamstring. I need to essentially load my hamstring and work it back through that longer range of motion to remove adhesions and kind of get it stretched back out to a regular place. That, yes. The other side, no. Ice also don't. Ice also doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Kind of like taking Advil. You may feel better acutely, but we think in the long term that it actually inhibits you from getting back to normal as fast as the big thing now is you want to you want to do stem, you want to move, you want to try to use all of that to clear the inflammation out of your lymph tissue. And those kind of things. There's some really fascinating stuff on ACL reconstructions where all they did was they did no ice, all they did was like stem and range of motion stuff, and they like you know, cut their recovery time by like a third afterwards. No ice. You want some of the inflammation, we should get it out of there so that we can get our range of motion. I used to teach, in my first job, we had undergrads that were athletic trainers, and I would give them shit constantly about all the things that they did that are bad. They didn't like it very much. I was like, y'all do a really important thing, but you do it badly. So you do it on nothing based on science. Is there another question? No? Okay. 
We know we talked about stretching while we're talking about the phase of time. All right. So here we're just kind of showing. So we've got how are we going to dehydrogenase, right? So there's these other things, these PDK ones through fours that are going to that are going to play some role in inhibiting PDH. Don't worry too much about these kinds of things, right? But ATP activates this PDK, which then phosphorylates the pyruvate dehydrogenase, which inhibits it. That's also going to be inhibited by starvation, high levels of NADH. So those are things that are you've got a lot of when you're at rest. These kinds of things when you have no food um, or low O2, which really never happens unless you're going to like go to Everest Base Camp or something and have high pulmonary function. We talk about low oxygen levels a lot, but that's what such a low is. It doesn't have to do I mean, we can give you arsenic and it can permanently inhibit that, but I'm not going to advise that, right? Now we're, now we're on an episode of a true crime podcast or something. We're giving people arsenic in the midst of this. And here's how calcium, high levels of calcium are going to activate these um, PDP um, enzymes, which are then going to dephosphorylate the PDH that activate. So there's all of these other things that are going to do these control steps. They're going to work on kind of how this thing becomes allosteric. And a lot of it is just driven by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, which is a very common way that we do it. So that's just a little bit more information on how some of that is regulated. It still doesn't answer Dave's question about how we have low glycogen. My guess is that the low glycogen thing is probably going to activate PDK4. So my guess is it's going to sort of mimic starvation or nutrient deprivation. It's my guess, but I don't know that for, for certain. Okay, so the other thing to kind of put a little bow on all of this, if you haven't already from a glycolytic standpoint is, and I'm gonna use a term on all of this, it's probably not the most accurate term, we're not the way that Dr. Deb, who is our metabolic expert would describe it, but I think it, it makes sense to me as well, I hope it makes sense to you guys, okay? So, one of the other, so we're, we've got rate control of pyruvate formations. We've got the top part of this, phosphorylase and PFA that control how much pyruvate we get. After all of that, the big thing that matters is where's the pyruvate flow? And so generally, and I'm going to call this a preference, but it's really not a preference, okay? But when the ability of the Krebs cycle to sort of take in this pyruvate by using PDH, and send the pyruvate into aerobic metabolism. When there is more pyruvate being made than can go this direction, then a lot of that leftover pyruvate then is going to bump into LDH and get driven in this direction. So whenever you're in a situation where pyruvate generation exceeds the capacity for aerobic metabolism to handle it, right, or take it in and do something with it, if you're going to be at the onset of exercise or doing very, very high intensity exercises, okay, apparently if you've given arsenic or something, then we're going to make a lot of lactate. Okay? When most of this pyruvate can be handled and taken into the Krebs cycle, then glucose to pyruvate into aerobic metabolism predominates and we make very little or very little lactic acid, all right? So in some ways, the downstream things here in aerobic metabolism are also going to have an influence on what can happen here. That's gonna become, not today, but that's gonna become really, 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 really important when we talk about adaptations to aerobic training, all right? You can ask Gabe what they know about mitochondrial genetics and why we have, you have more mitochondria, you have more PDH, you've got more Krebs cycle enzymes. So much that more pyruvate can go this direction. So you have more mitochondria because you're better able to train. And you give an exercise intensity to handle more pyruvate that direction, you make less lactate. Okay. Also, we're going to get into the lipid metabolism. Next Monday, I have more Krebs cycle enzymes. I can make more energy from lipid, which just bypasses this entirely. And if I'm making plenty there, then I have more ATP and it keeps PFK and phosphorylase inhibited. 
And I don't even make the power ribbon, I just make energy flow. Right? So there's a lot of kind of really interesting things that go on because of this. You guys with me so far? You okay? Size with me. I don't know about anybody else. I'm looking at this. Yeah. Okay. So on the aerobic side, so basically downstream of PDH in the Krebs cycle in the electron transport chain, things, the, the control of those is because there's so many steps, okay? Because there's so many steps, the control of all of that is a little bit more general because you've got to get through all of these things time. Just the physical amount of time that it takes to move through there is also going to become important. Okay. So oxidative metabolism is essentially controlled by the rate of the electron transport chain and the rate of the Krebs cycle. We'll talk about what each of these things are controlled by. Okay. ETC activity is increased when ADP levels go up and organic phosphate levels go up. It's inhibited when ATP levels Okay. So this is largely going to be inhibited at rest, but it's still able to produce the vast majority of the energy that we need at rest. So it's a very, very large capacity to increase the speed and the, the capacity, kind of total capacity of the ATP to the electron transport. Okay. As ETC activity goes up, then you're going to need more oxygen because oxygen is the final electron acceptor at the end of all of this. Therefore, O2 uptake is going to be more And so when we measure VO2 during any kind of exercise or at rest, as it goes up with intensity, all that that means is that the electron transport chain activity is increasing. And so we need more oxygen down here to be our final electron okay. That's kind of what's happening. Okay, the rate of the Krebs cycle, it has an actual rate control enzyme. Okay. But it's also primarily controlled by the rate of the electron transport chain because in order for Krebs to proceed, we need to be able to recycle the electron field. So we need three molecules of NAD and FAD to carry the electrons that are stripped off as we go around the cycle. And so how do we get these things to be recycled? Well, they have to be able to donate their electrons into the electron transport chain. So when ETC speed goes up or its activity goes up, it recycles these things faster, which then returns them to the Krebs cycle faster. And that means we can put more pyruvate through the Krebs cycle, okay? So generally increases in ADP and organic phosphate and NAD drive an increase in the rate of Krebs. And then ATP and NADH, as you might imagine, is going to decrease the things that are doing. So that's mostly what's going on. But again, you need to remember that there are five or six steps in the Krebs cycle and three or four steps in the electron transport chain. Even when they're going as fast as they can, it still takes a certain amount of time to move things through here. And through here, you've got to get the pyruvate into the mitochondria. You've got to move through the transition step of those things. And so there's just a time component. So during sub-maximal exercise, sub-maximal exercise, for the most part, the rate of metabolism is not at all controlled by oxygen. Okay? Not at all controlled by oxygen. Your capacity to put oxygen on the hemoglobin and to get that hemoglobin into the capillaries and to get the oxygen out of the off the hemoglobin into your muscles generally dramatically exceeds your ability okay, during submaximal exercise to use that oxygen. Okay. During maximal exercise levels at, at VO2 max, it may be limited by oxygen. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. That part is a little bit like. We'll get into the kind of hows and whys of all of that. And maybe during maximal levels of small muscle mass exercise, it may be limited. I assure you, if I have you run at VO2 max, you're not going to run for very long. And so 
is made up of these kinds of issues. Okay. We know that aerobic training increases mitochondrial numbers. And so the question then is how does my mitochondrial number? Okay. So let's look at the individual contributions of the energy pathways. This is a, a nice chart that I like. And again, it's not exhaustive, and all of this is going to get pushed around a little bit by some other factors. But in general, right, if you're going to do, let's just say, exercise that lasts one to three seconds. I'm going to do one squat. Okay, one squat. That was primarily 100% anaerobic to do that one squat. Okay, I'm going to do 10 seconds of exercise. So I'm going to do like four or five squats. We're going to get a little bit of aerobic, but again, it's mostly. So as you lengthen the time of exercise, that increases. Then we begin to sort of shift ourselves down where aerobic exercise is going to become more of an aerobic. A lot of this is going to be dependent as well upon what's the absolute work rate. Okay, what's the absolute work rate? If I'm doing 60 seconds of walking, then maybe it is 70 30. If it's 60 seconds of an, you know, however fast I can go, it's probably not 70 30 because we need so much more energy. It may be more 85, 15 or something. So the, the rate of this is gonna, is gonna matter a little bit. Well, this just gives you also kind of corresponding to these things. It's gonna give you some examples of exercises, right? Tennis, field hockey, right? Soccer or something like that. A 200 meter swim, a 1500 meter run, an 800 meter swim, 10,000, know, like you're running a 10K or something. So that's just going to kind of show you guys a sliding scale of kind of some very, very rough types of things that we're going to do. Okay. okay. So we've got a few minutes here. We're going to start. We'll talk about carbohydrate metabolism just a little. So we've kind of covered the pathway. Right? We know that carbohydrates go through glycolysis. And then into the Krebs cycle. We know that I can have glycogen stored inside of a muscle, and I can break that down with phosphorylase. And so now there's going to be glucose from that glycogen floating around in my muscle cell. Or I can take glucose up from the bloodstream. Okay. So to understand this, we kind of need to look at where are our repositories of these things. So depending upon what you've eaten and when you last eaten. You just smashed a bag of gummy bears an hour ago. And you may have some amount of glucose in your blood. Okay. Maybe nine or 10 grams, depending upon your diet. You have muscle glycogen, again, depending upon your diet and your exercise last, that may range from, say, 300 to 700 grams. So, vastly more than our plasma glucose. And you've also got some liver glycogen as well. It's going to be less than muscle glycogen, but it's going to be way more than that. Okay. So how are we going to get these carbs either from the plasma into our cells, or how are we going to get it from muscle and liver glycogen into the muscle cells so that we can use it either in glycolysis or in the Okay. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to use this group four enzyme via insulin and muscle contraction. Okay, we'll talk about that. Or we're going to use this. Glycogenolysis using the phosphorylase that we're going to break down here with the muscle cell. So let's start by talking about how we get glucose out of your blood and into your muscles so that we can then put it into glycolysis and start doing something. You have proteins or receptors that are these transport molecules, and they're called GLUT, okay, G L U T, they're GLUT molecules. You have these transporter proteins. You've got loop one, basically through loop five, although I swear there's even more of those now than before. Some of these proteins, okay, loop four specifically, is going to work via insulin. Okay? The other ones are going to be insulin independent. So loop two, loop one, loop three. I don't know what the hell's going on with loop five, um, all these kinds of things. Are going, to, are going to be uh, independent of it 
is. If you will note that right when you have GLUT2 in the liver, that's going to help us get glute glucose into the liver, brain, and other tissues are going to have one and three, and then red blood cells are going to primarily use one. Okay. GLUT4 is primarily going to be located on skeletal muscle, and it's going to primarily be dependent upon binding. Okay. How many of you guys have any sense of how we regulate blood glucose? Maybe you had a, a physiology class as undergrads. Maybe you know something about diabetes or how those things are going to work, right? So, the kind of global way to think about all this is your body wants to very, very tightly control and maintain some adequate amount of blood glucose because your brain needs glucose. If your blood glucose falls too far, you will go into a coma and you may die. Okay. Take a diabetic and they haven't had, they haven't had a candy bar or anything for a while, their blood glucose levels are really, are really, really low, then they can go into what we call a diabetic coma. Same thing can happen to you if I just don't feed you enough for a while. You have no Although in you guys, you can have substrate, like we can turn muscle through, through the liver and gluconeogenesis into glucose, and we can, we can stay for a while. But we try to tightly regulate it at about 100 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood at rest. Okay? So we're going to help regulate all of this by changing insulin levels coming out of the pancreas. Okay? We're also going to kind of Put on top of all of that, the ability of skeletal muscle specifically to move GLUT4 to the, to the cell membrane independent of insulin during exercise. And then whether you're postprandial, so post eating a meal, whether you're starving, whether you're actually in these physiological conditions that are going to alter these things, in addition to what's happening with insulin, that are all going to play some role in how we try to regulate this blood glucose. And the idea is that we just want to keep blood glucose constant. Okay. You eat a meal, your blood glucose goes up, you release insulin, and insulin drives the glucose either into, right, into skeletal muscle, into, into adipose tissue if it needs to, if your skeletal muscle has plenty. Okay. You start exercising, the blood glucose that begins to, to bring glucose out of the blood, these things fall. Then you're going to start breaking that glycogen to dump it back in there. Insulin falls during exercise because the kidneys would all die every time you try to exercise. So there's some kind of things that are going to be Okay. Let's talk about insulin signals. I don't want to say that the insulin receptor and insulin signaling is the best understood and most widely studied hormone receptor and signaling pathway of anything in the world, but if it's not, it's really, really close, okay? And yet, there's still a Nobel Prize to be won that's waiting out there that we have to figure out for those kind of mechanisms, okay? Here's a very, very kind of rough diagram of what's happening. This is, let's just imagine, this is the sarcolemma of a skeletal muscle, okay? This is a capillary on this side. You have eaten a bag of gummy bears. You've waited 45 minutes. Your blood glucose is shot up. Your pancreas has released insulin. Both the glucose and the insulin are floating around. They get into your capillary. They bind to the insulin receptor. Okay? We're going to give phosphorylation. We're going to phosphorylate as one. It's going to activate PI3 kinase, blah, 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 AKT all of these sorts of things, and then some shit happens down here that we don't really understand. The magic of inside your skeletal muscle, you have vesicles that have glut in. Insulin binds, big signaling cascade. The end result of it is, hey, glut four vesicle, go to the membrane, bind, put the glut four in the membrane, glucose floats by, binds to glut four, glut four then pulls the glucose into your cell. We've now magically lowered blood glucose and increased glucose in skeletal muscle. Okay. Every time you eat something, this is what happens. Okay. Every time. That's insulin mediated glucose uptake. Okay. 
Let's think about this. Can we all agree? Will you all stipulate that in the exercise, we probably would be useful to get more glucose into my muscle cells? Does that seem reasonable? That might be a useful thing to do. At rest, that is driven by insulin. When you start exercising, insulin falls very dramatically. And yet, we continue to take glucose into our muscle cells. Okay. So there is a thing that is called contraction mediated glucose uptake that functions through basically the insulin pathway. We just don't need insulin. To activate. Okay. If I had Christina stand up and do some jumping jacks and the muscles that she was using do jumping jacks, she's magically going to start sticking root four molecules into the membranes of those muscle cells so that it can take up more glucose. Okay. So it's just like, an, like a constant like shift. Yes. They never, they never stay in the Right. They go, they pull some stuff in, they get sucked back into the vesicles, some new ones come, they get recycled, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. so Always in a state of flux. So, say with hypertrophy. Yep. Would that mean that group four molecules will stay longer? Or no, you just have more muscle. Okay. All of which are going to have group four molecules in them. And so you have a larger absolute capacity to stick carbohydrate into those muscles because they're bigger, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why increasing or maintaining muscle mass is great for type 2 diabetics or from preventing yourself from ever becoming a type 2 diabetic. Mm -hmm. okay. So this happens. Arguably the most famous, or one of the most famous exercise physiologists in the world has been studying how and why this happens for, I don't know, 50 years. We haven't figured it out yet. We don't know what the magic signal is yet. Probably calcium mediated, probably activated by calcium. It's a reasonable thing. Calcium does something that activates one of these kinds of things. The problem is, is that you try to do animal model research where you knock out one of these things so that it doesn't work and figure out what, what is the absolute thing and you knock one of them out and the whole pathway gets jacked up as things. Okay? We will figure it out and it will win a Nobel Prize. You guys see what, what won the Nobel Prize in medicine this week? Pain receptors. The identification of um, uh, B1. Which is the thing that when you eat spicy things, it makes it taste spicy and it burns and it provokes those kinds of things. So that's right. Trip B1, which I thought was pretty cool. But this, we'll figure this out at some point. We'll cure diabetes because of it. Or we'll just learn how the, our biomedical engineers will learn how to grow some pancreas and these kinds of things. And we'll cure diabetes that way. And Law, we'll, 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 we'll figure it out at some point. But we will get there. Okay? So I was taught not to do it with contraction. I was taught that it was called the insulin like effect of exercise. And the reason that insulin has to fall when you start exercising is because the contractions are doing this. If you also got insulin as going up as a part of this, you dump too much in and your blood glucose would fall and you might die. Basically, pick a hormone and all they all go up during exercise except for insulin. All right, except for insulin. So are you an endo? Are you an endo? Is that a reasonable thing? Yeah, to say that. Right. They all go up. Epi, norepi, glucagon, like you name it, they all go up. Insulin goes down. That's kind of the general way to, to describe it. Okay. We will revisit a little bit of this signaling pathway when we get to muscle hypertrophy. Because part of this is shared. AKT and these things are shared. We know that insulin has anabolic effects because you need to bring this in so you've got the ATP to make the energy to hopefully drive the increase in protein synthesis and to bring some other substrates down. Okay. 
but it's going to be important. We'll revisit a little bit of this from there as well. Okay. You know what? This is enough. We'll stop here. We'll talk about glycogen. We'll pick up with glycogen and finish the rest of this stuff off on Monday. Okay. If, pardon? Quiz Monday. Quiz Monday. If you have questions about your take home test, I'm around tomorrow. You can ask me. Okay. That's fine. Better to ask than to just sort of wonder what all is going on. In the absence of that, if you go to Dallas this weekend, please be careful, make your choices. If you don't go, enjoy the fact no one's going to be in town. Thank you.